Jack Cashel, at the risk of sounding, let's say, a little bit hokey, I'm going to extend you a Cade Mila Foyte because I know you'll get that. Not all of my guests will, but it's a, it's an Irish greeting, and you're an Irish American, and I'm really proud to have you on my show, Cade Mila Foyte. A thousand million. Welcomes. Um, <laughs> I knew you'd get and, that. In the age of inflation, that, that uh, translates to like three welcomes, like a, you know, five years ago. <laughs> well, you got the wit of the Irish too, I can uh, see. Uh, um, so you're, I'm up in New Jersey. You're all homeland, as it were, but Ireland right. is your ancestral homeland. Yeah. And you're in Kansas City today. Correct. Um, a lot of people know you as this prolific author and ghostwriter and a frequent contributor to numerous publications. And I could go on and on, but just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, and you know, because the project I'm working on now is a project very close to home for me. And, and that is, it's, it's, the working title is Dispossessed, uh, the untold story of America's great ethnic diaspora. And in a sense, uh, my family is the victim of two diasporas. The first one, when my great-great-grandfather left, uh, uh, Ireland in, uh, in 1847, Black 47, in the midst of the potato famine, left County Waterford and came to New Jersey. And he uh, landed in the Princeton area, eventually, the, and moved to Princeton. Eventually, the family moved to Newark, where I grew up. And, um, and just the gist of the book is, and because I could encapsulate, encapsulate my own story in it, is that in the 1960s, uh, Newark uh, collapsed. And those of us who were there at the time uh, were forced to, to, to leave, to move, to go elsewhere. And the way that has been uh, you know, recreated by the people in control of the narratives like the media and academia is that it was white flight, that we were afraid of black people and that we just fled you know, just for the heck of it. But it's an absolutely false story that needs to be untold. And that's basically what I'm doing in this book, uh, The Dispossessed. No one wanted to leave. Uh, we had a wonderful neighborhood in Newark in the Roseville section, particularly sort of an Irish section in Newark. And they built a highway right through our, our neighborhood. It's like a, a dagger right through the heart of uh, Roseville. And, and what, we're, they took my house. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, uh, uh, we had to leave in our case. And then our, the neighborhood collapsed around it. You know, when you have a, you just imagine throwing like a, a basketball sized court 20 feet deep in the middle of a, a thriving, you know, commercial neighborhood uh, built around a church, you know, a very communal, very traditional, uh, and just very lively in a secular sense as well. And, and it was all gone. And Gosh. So take us back to that, the popular narrative that the white people were leaving because of the black people. That's not, that's not accurate. No. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I, in this, I have the advantage here and speaking from my own experience and what I knew and what I could see. And I'm using, by the way, my neighborhood of Roseville uh, in, in particular, in general, the city of Newark and in larger to uh, all cities throughout the Northeast and North Central United States who went through, under, through underwent the same thing. And by the way, I, I, anyone who has a story to tell, I welcome them to, to contact me through my website, casual.com, because I'm, I'm looking for personal stories. Yeah, yeah, we'll make sure we emphasize that throughout the uh, this episode. Yeah, what happened, and I, I just, you know, uh, a good summary of what happened, uh, and the way that the dynamic works is that in 2017, this woman from Princeton University, scholar on uh, white flight, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, uh, you know, introducing her thesis as to white flight. Was it just pure racism or was it also economics? That's what she debated. She said, just like the 2016 election, did people vote for Donald Trump because of racism or economics or a combination of the both? That was the, those are the alternatives posed. And so I read the op-ed and it was just typical academic op-ed. And by the way, it wasn't nearly as bad as the, the kind of thesis is generated by uh, the anti-racist crowd, like there's, you know, the Kendi and all those kind of people. But uh, so then I looked at the comments. There were over 800 comments. Wow. And I, I expected the comments to be, this being New York Times readers, John, I expected the comments to be, oh, you didn't go far enough in blasting those white people, those, you know. But 
it had to be a shock to the uh, author herself because the comment was one after another. Let me tell you what happened in Detroit. Let me tell you what happened in Baltimore. Let me happen to tell you what happened in Cleveland. Let me tell you what happened in Boston. Give very specific descriptions of uh, relentlessly violent crime. And, uh, and then people would say, how could you possibly write an op-ed in the New York Times about white flight and not mention crime or schools, you know? Uh, this, and people were, were flabbergasted. And, and the uh, author, Leah Bustan, had to be devastated by these comments because what she, she concludes her essay with this, John. She says, um, you know, it could be this, it could be that, the reasons people led, but, you know, no one has uh, uh, articulated the reasons they left and they probably don't even know why. It was just such a condescending piece of crap, you know. You, yeah. I had already talked to 50 people who told me exactly why they left, you know. Yeah. And I knew why we left. Uh, and uh, so that was, I, I realized I'm just exploring a, a, a 60 year myth uh, that has uh, hardened into, uh, you know, dogma in academia. And that's almost completely untrue, right? Right. But, but we, we have heard and we read the stories about the rioting during that period. Right. Uh, you know, the headlines, the Bronx is burning. Detroit and all of that. So had it, hadn't this some part in white people leaving? Oh yeah, and uh, I will tell you, you know, uh, there was a major riot in Newark in 1967. It was the first major riot in the Northeast and 26 people were killed, including one cop and one fireman. Um, and so, you know, when I first posted this on my alumni, my grade school alumni homepage, I, I got all these outpouring of, people wanting to tell stories. And uh, yeah, it affected it because it, it singed our neighborhood. And uh, like the one woman told me, she goes, I left because of the riots. I said, what do you mean you left because of the riots? Was, was like, was that the, what provoked you? No, she said, they came down my street. They were attacking our my parents in my house. You know, My sister's boyfriend had to come to rescue us. They knocked us down while we were trying to get to our car. We never came back, you know? Yeah. Um, that's, that is kind of a direct provocation. I had a friend, uh, one friend, a good friend of mine, who's a Democrat, and uh, his wife's very liberal. And we, uh, I was talking to them when I was back in New Jersey last month. And I said to him, you know, because uh, this is seen to be like a racist thing, but Democrats are not racist, of course, they're above that. And I said to him, I said, Art, uh, hmm. why did you finally leave? Because he lived on my block. And, but they didn't, the highway didn't take his house. So his, his house was still there, his apartment. He was living with his widowed mother. He was probably 21 years old, 22. And I said, why did you finally leave? And then he's searching for the word. And he said, ah, the neighborhood finally became untenable. And I said, Art, what does is, what is untenable mean? Explain untenable. He goes, untenable means when your mother gets mugged, for the second time, that's untenable. When your home gets invaded for the second time, that's untenable. Uh, when we moved to the block, John, and my family moved to the block in 1953, there was a black family living next door to us when we moved there. You know, there's a triplex with three black families in it. And yeah. ours was a triplex with three white families. Our block had been integrated as long, as long as I knew it. You know, there was no panic, there was no flight. They would tell the story about and I've read this 50 times if I've read it once, uh, blockbusters would come and they'd go to the homeowners and say, they're moving in. And sometimes these blockbusters would hire black women, push baby carriages down the street, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, I just looked at the 1950 census on my block. 95% of the people were renters. Every single person on that block, there were uh, 363 people living on a block, one block long. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and there were represented among them was every single working class occupation you could possibly imagine, including yeah. casket maker, you know, rubber molder. <laughs> oh, I mean, wow. You know, uh, there was not a professional on the block. Okay. Uh, and then just to give you another sense of what happened in, in two America cities, there were 93 families units on that block. 91 of them were male headed. In two cases, there was either widow or a divorcee. 91 out of 93 or were male headed. Headed. So intact family right. units as right. such. 89 of the 91 uh, had a male working. Two guys were unemployed. 
Uh, this is in 1950. And within 20 years, there was not a working, there was not an intact family on the whole block. Wow. I mean, that's how, how catastrophic the collapse was. So, Jack, I'm, I'm trying to, I, it, this is a very interesting narrative that you're spinning and no better a person than an Irish American to tell a really good story and to get the real story out. So was it social and economic decay, cultural decay, uh, war politics, perhaps? There was a combination of things. Everything that could possibly hit Newark hit it, including corrupt government, uh, the, the eagerness to knock down the whole neighborhood. So you know, your corrupt pals could get the demolition contract. This, I mean, the Sopranos is based out of Newark. Yeah. And uh, one of the family, the family that it's based on is called the Boyardo family. And they were in the demolition business, right? <laughs> so, you know, you'd have these urban renewal projects where they knocked down, including in Italian neighborhoods, which was a little Italy got totally wiped out so they could build a horrible housing project that was uh, useless within 10 years. And a lot of that had to do with rewarding your friends, getting contracts for your friends. Mm -hmm. Some of the government planning was benign, but it was misguided. And some of it was uh, subverted by people wanting to make a buck out of things. So you yeah. had that going on. But the two major forces were this. One was the collapse of the black family uh, under pressure from the US government, which kept incentivizing uh, uh, fatherlessness. Oh, you have a father at home? No, no welfare. No father at home? No public housing. Father at home? No Medicaid. Father at home? No food stamps. It was, let me stop you there, Jack. They were encouraging them to go on the welfare rolls. Yeah, to their policies. Right. And, and the way you get on welfare is not to have a working. Not to have a thing, and yeah, okay. So there are tons of incentives, and on top of that, you had the radicalization of black politics in the late 1960s, and that lit a fuse. The combination of people were frustrated by their uh, family disorganization, anger at the fact that they don't have family and have parents in the home. Uh, and now they're given a, a motive, they're given an incentive, they're given someone to hate. Mm -hmm. uh, they're being told this by the radical, you know, firebrands. You know, it's not your fault, it's the white man's fault, you know. And the white man, in this case, happened to be people who are no better off than they were, you know, living in, you know, third floor or fourth floor walk-ups in a, a city that is, uh, you know, old and decaying. So, but in the media accounts, those of us left behind in the cities became the villains. Whether mm -hmm. we stayed, we became Archie Bunker. If we left, we were white flight. So anyhow, I'm trying to straighten that out. It's very interesting. And it's, it's, it's way more nuanced than the popular narrative. Um, plain devil's advocate, if you will. Uh, there are those who will strongly and do strongly disagree with what you're saying. They'd say, oh, Jack, come on segregation back then and you know a lot of white people held up their nose if they saw a black person walking down the street was it like that back you in know, those uh, days I, i'm not gonna say there wasn't any discrimination because there was but by 1950 in newark uh all institutional discrimination had, had come to an end by 1960 65 and across america all institutional discrimination was essentially over you'd have and this is where white breaks down and this is why i'm using the, the notion of an ethnic diaspora. Because in Newark, there were just, there were many ethnic groups, but the three dominant ethnic groups circa 1960 were Irish, Italian, and Jewish. And they each reacted differently to the forces that were uh, set loose. Uh, the Jews in Newark, uh, you know, they had a brilliant neighborhood. They had the best public high school in the country. It was 83% Jewish and as late as 1960. And it was, a, it was a remarkably productive group of people, the most productive people in America, period. I mean, there's no yeah. denying that in terms of academics, in terms of uh, yeah. uh, show business, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever measure. It's brilliant, other things, brilliant, brilliant, a brilliant community, yeah. yeah. They were also the most welcoming, the most mm -hmm. liberal, the ones who set up committees to welcome black neighbors to their community, right? The opposite of that, the Irish were in between, the opposite of that were the Italians. They were the most resistant. They were the most uh, defensive. They were the, the least welcoming. Mm. Well, here's what happens. By 1970, virtually all the Jews were gone. They all left, right? By the Italians fought it out <laughs> to, the, to the bitter yeah. end. They didn't want to leave. And they were not afraid to take matters into their own hands, you know? 
what happened with the Jews. And that's why when you talk about white flight, if you can't break it down ethnically, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, the problem with the Jews is they were totally dependent on public schools. And as soon as the schools, you know, you know, the Italians are just happy sending their, I'm generalizing here, but yeah. uh, if they have a mediocre high school in their neighborhood, which they did, Barringer and Newark, they were okay with it. You know, just as long as the kids were safe and they learned something, they get on and whatnot. Where the Jews had very high standards for the kids, very high standards for teachers, for the academics. They wanted their kids to go to Ivy League schools, et cetera. They couldn't deal with schools that were no longer functioning the way they once did. And they were gone. Uh, I mean, I looked at the, in 1958, there was only a handful of black students at Weequake High School. I looked at the 1970 yearbook, there were 13 white students in a graduating class of 400. Wow. At Barringer, meanwhile, that didn't happen. You know, Barringer is in North Newark, the Italian part of Newark. That was my neighborhood high school. So uh, first of all, it just is wrong to talk about white flight in general without breaking it down ethnically. And the Jewish pattern repeated itself in every major city in America as the Italian pattern. Yeah. The Irish pattern was, by 1960, Irish were no longer cohesive uh, ethnically in Newark as a neighborhood, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they were at the whims, plus their, the Irish political power in Newark had dissolved by 1962 when the last Irish mayor lost his election. Yeah. So what part did the race riots play in any of this? Uh, they, they were the uh, final straw. Hmm. You know, that for so many people I talked to said that was it. I can't I can't deal with this anymore. Mm -hmm. So many of the merchants lost their businesses. Yeah. Uh, and those were mostly Jewish merchants, too, by the way. In uh, uh, mind, the riots singed my neighborhood. They, they at the, the fringe of my neighborhood had full scale rioting. What saved my neighborhood was that the armory was a block from my house, you know, <laughs> uh, so. That was wow. not a place you'd want to attack, but no, uh, it was, it lasted five days. It was frightening. Uh, and, Where were you? Uh, Do you remember it as a child? I was, at, I was at camp that summer. So I was watching it on TV, but all my relatives and friends were there and everyone I talked to has a story. I mean, they, yeah. you know, of, uh, even people who were sympathetic to the rioters have stories. So uh, your dad you know, was a Newark cop. Yes, my, my, and that's, you know, uh, obviously influences my thinking in many ways. And uh, my father was a, a Newark cop. Uh, my uncle, uh, also Irish, Newark cop. You know, we have a lot of cops in our family, my a couple cousins. Yeah. In fact, last month, uh, John, when I was in New Jersey, I had my one of my cousins uh, who's still in a Newark police force give me a, an insider tour of the whole city. And we went out on two days, and I'm not sure I'd have gone without a it was an unmarked car, but everyone knew it was a police car. And <laughs> I had an armed guard to uh, guide me, you know. So, oh, gosh. Did uh, you stop off at McGoffrin's? That's I didn't know I didn't stop watering hole. <laughs> but I did go through my old neighborhood, you know, which is not the same as it was. But yeah. Was so what was, the, what was the proportions of uh, ethnic groups in Europe back then? You mentioned Irish, Italian, Jewish, and then black. What would it, how did it break out? I would say, I would say, no, let's take your 1960. Uh, at that time, Newark was about 35% black. Uh, I would say it, it was probably 25% uh, Italian, 20%, 25% Jewish. Let's mm -hmm. I guess 85. Uh, no, I'll pull those percentages back in each case 20, 50, 20 to 20, 75, 15% Irish by that time, 10% Polish, you know, yeah. German. Uh, uh, the Portuguese had yet to move into Newark. Uh, the Puerto Ricans were beginning to come into Newark. So you had a lot of mix. By my generation, every Irishman I know had a German in a woodpile somewhere, you know, or some yeah. <laughs> German in the background somewhere, you know. Yeah, so, so. yeah. Um, so uh, is your book going to cover other neighborhoods in America yes. or will, will New York be the, the central focus? The central focus will be uh, my neighborhood and Newark uh, larger, but in a sense, broke like up the there, Jewish Jack. experience in Weequake is recreated. You, sorry, Jack, you broke up there. Just repeat that. The central focus will be Newark and? Uh, in Roseville, my neighborhood. I see. Starting Roseville, uh, branching outward to Newark. And from there, 
uh, taking these experiences and looking at other cities that have had comparable experiences. So yeah, what, what you see, John, is that the, the Jewish experience in Newark was a lot more like the Jewish experience in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, than it was like the Italian experience in Newark. Yeah. And the Italian experience in Newark was a lot more like the Italian experience in Boston than it was the, you know, uh, the Jewish experience in Newark. So it's, yeah, it, it's more by ethnic group it is in terms of the response. Yeah, you have a rare and interesting insight to, let's call it urban decay, urban breakdown and so on. And you've a lot of ideas. How could a city like New York, how could it have, how could it have been saved, if you will? Well, that's an excellent question. And uh, yesterday I saw it because I, uh, and I, I've been talking to individuals. I've been interviewing them over the phone. I've spoken probably 50 people by now. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I spoke to a woman who grew up on my block, uh, who is, became the mayor of a suburban city, right? Mm -hmm. And she's a Democrat. Uh, the day before, I spoke to a woman who lived across the street from me, who became the mayor of a, of a New Jersey suburb and in, as a Republican, right? Mm -hmm. So they have different perspectives. And when I talked to the Democrats, I asked them that question. I said, how could this city even say, what differently could we have done? I mean, because no one can deny that it collapsed. Mm. That was the question of why did this happen? And uh, this is what I get from uh, my liberal friends. Uh, and they'll say something like this. Well, you know, uh, people were so prejudiced. We needed to teach them not to be prejudiced. We needed to, to do a better job of teaching them not to be prejudiced, right? And then I go back and look at the experience of the Jews in Newark who are doing exactly that, you know, working very hard to overcome prejudice, working very hard. They're essentially a liberal population trying to do the right thing. And it didn't work out, uh, you know? So it, it, it's a, there's a naivete in that perspective. The right. People who, who left Newark earlier, like the woman I was talking to yesterday uh, was older. So she grew, she, she was finished, she had grown up and by the 50s, she had graduated, blah, 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 and moved on. Those of us who grew up in the 60s, and she said this, so much depends not on where you live, but when you live there, right? Yeah. So I, my experience as an adolescent was entirely in the 1960s. Yeah. And my brother's was in 1950s. We had, you know, whole, we lived in different worlds. Yeah. Uh, and we have a hard time communicating uh, between ourselves sometimes, you know? That's very interesting, yeah. So, so you grew up Irish American in Europe. What was it like then? Uh, uh, you know, it was um, the Irish American experience then was much more traditional than it is now. I mean, mm -hmm. so on St. Patrick's Day parade, uh, for St. Patrick's Day it was a reverential day. You know, it hadn't yet degenerated into the the, the rolling debauch that it is today. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's the, the rolling bar. Yeah, you know, and ending up at a piano bar singing "Danny Boy," but. Uh, uh, yeah. But I, you know, remember my father and brother and uncles wearing uh, top hats and you know like morning coats and you know and you'd march and uh, okay. uh, I remember uh, you know my my sister's husband is from Ireland or his parents are from Ireland and I, I marched in one of their parades oh probably 1982 that's the last one I was in New Jersey and they were very sober right? and very serious and and boy <laughs> if you screwed up when you're you're marching. You know, and I was right at the at the bishopric. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was very, you know, I like that because the the parades we have here in Kansas City, where I live, are, are just a joke. I mean, they're, you know, you wear fluorescent green shirts, you get drunk all day, and you know, a little Hollywood, a little yeah. Disney. Um, what role, and I'm assuming it played a big role, did the church play in your neighborhood? Uh, it was the heart of our neighborhood. Mm. It was the living, breathing heart of our neighborhood. My neighborhood was overwhelmingly Catholic, um, and uh, it was uh, it was the, there was only, there was many Italians when I grew up as there were Irish, but we were the two dominant ethnic groups. There were some others, but um, yeah, I, I in my grade school I found that here's this is hard for some people to believe, but I was looking through clippings, and I found a um, you know I'm a classic baby boomer, you know I mean just put me in perspective, but. Mm -hmm. I found a clipping from my kindergarten year at St. Rosa Lima uh, in Newark. And it says, the headline was a little awkward. It says, sister cares for 
148 children in her kindergarten class, right? Oh, jeez. So, oh, my gosh. And then it says, it says, 74 in the morning, 74 in the afternoon. <laughs> when I ask people, what's a big class? You know, you ask a oh. public school teacher, oh, 25. Well, in my fourth grade class, we had 66, you know. Uh, so the everyone went to the church and everyone went to school. School was free. We didn't have to pay yeah. because there yeah. were so many parishioners. Yeah. There's a public school on my block, literally 100 yards from my house, if that. And you went there if you really screwed up. That, you held that over your head, you know. Screw yeah. up here, you're going to end up at Rose 11. You know, you're going to end up down there. Yeah. Uh, they were at, at least a half a grade, a grade behind us. The rituals of the church were just a big part of our lives. You know, all the, you know, Christmas and Easter and everything. And people got dressed up. And, you know, I yeah. could walk to school. I was two blocks away. So did sound like um, happy times before things started to decline intact families law and order yeah um all of those things yeah and when i talk to these people and I, you know a lot of these people i haven't talked to in 50 years mm -hmm. and um i would would turn what, what comes out of these kind of discussions is how much they loved our neighborhood it was very close to the perfect neighborhood because mm -hmm. we not only had the church at the center of it but we had two movie theaters within two blocks we had Every shop lined up and down Arm Street, which was our main street, the diner, the, the teen hangout, uh, you know, soda pop fountain, the, you know, the candy store, the little grocery store, the A&P. It was a totally functional, harmonious world. Crime was uh, non-existent. I mean, it was, you never heard of it in the 50s. And the 60s, everything changed. Yeah. Okay. Crazy. You know, the change got crazy. But, and to deny that, is to is to subject the people who experienced is to blame the victim is to yeah. subject the people who experienced that to uh, a, a level of scrutiny that other crime victims are not subject to well traditionally and even to this day the irish irish americans have been big democrats and we have one in the white house joe biden who traces his ancestry to ireland and to pretty close to me back at home in the wee county of Louth. I think he has some ancestors buried up there and then another set buried over in Mayo. Um, you talked about, you know, policies, political policies, social policies and so on. Weren't those introduced and promoted by the Democratic Party? Yes. Did it but... contribute? In other words, did, did our own people contribute to our own decline uh good question yes and it's interesting um because that factors into my book also uh in 1956 for instance uh eisenhower who was republican president carried essex county which is newark's county uh easily i mean like 60 to 40 right 1960 comes everyone in my world was for jfk right yeah we were all for Kennedy. I was 12, but I was, I, I, I was a paper boy and I consumed my product. I, I still remember how I felt when he won the West Virginia primary or the Wisconsin primary. I mean, that's how, how deeply into it I was. My parents who had voted for Eisenhower, like all the, you know, like most people in, in my neighborhood, voted for Kennedy. And then the story became Kennedy wins in spite of being Catholic. No, Kennedy won because he was Catholic. Essex County, which had gone 60-40 Eisenhower in 56, went 60-40 Kennedy in 1960. That's the impact that made. And, he, and, and uh, Kennedy carried New Jersey by a hair. And it was because of people like us. Yeah. So we became Democrats uh, by default because Kennedy was a Democrat. You know, it wasn't a question of policy. We weren't thinking that far ahead. Mm -hmm. um, the guy who could have saved uh, straightened out America was a great Irish Catholic, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He who, was good and he had some interesting sociological papers and thoughts, but you tell us this. Yeah, right, because he was in the Johnson administration. You know, after Kennedy dies, we inherit Johnson as Democrats, and no one's enthused about this, but I I'm identifying as a Democrat. Everyone I know is identifying as a Democrat now because we're all Kennedy fans, you know, even though we're kids. The older people 
like the mayor I talked to, the Democratic mayor, well, she was older. She was like 21 when Kennedy comes along. And so then your identification is pretty total as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. So that's, in a sense, uh, Irish have been largely Democratic before. They had, they had begun to sort of redistribute their votes uh, roughly relevant, you know, relative to the whole population. And then with Kennedy, they shift heavily to the, to the Democratic side. The policies that were in place were not the result of any kind of Irish influence in particular, but Daniel Patrick Moynihan comes along. And in 1965, he, uh, he is an assistant secretary of labor. He writes what's come to be known as the Moynihan Report. And he does a brilliant diagnosis of what's happening to the black family in America under the weight of all these welfare programs, et cetera. He said, we have to address this above all else. At that time, 25% of black children were living with a single parent. Today, 75%. It's, it's such a tragedy. And it, and it was a tragedy at 25%. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so Moynihan's report uh, is uh, when it's inside the White House, everyone's saying, boy, this is really, yeah, this is really honest. And it was very sympathetic. And he was, you know, uh, it wasn't racist at all. I just read it recently. Um, it, it couldn't have been more sympathetic. It couldn't have been more encouraging. And, and so it, then uh, Johnson, Lyndon Johnson releases it publicly and never known for his moral courage. He gets uh, ba uh, blasted by the civil rights community. And uh, how dare you try to uh, speak, by this time in 65, we had moved from, you know, age of, uh, you know, Martin Luther King harmony integration into, you know, black nationalism, black rights, black power. And uh, they blast him because for daring to have an opinion on this subject. And what's curious, uh, John, uh, the parallel to in 2008, Barack Obama is running for president. Now, here's the guy with the opportunity to actually make a difference. He's already locked up the Democratic primary. He's at Father's Day in a, in a church in Chicago. And he gives a speech on fatherlessness. It's Father's Day. And then he goes through the statistics. You know, black boys without a father, 20 times more likely to end up in prison, 10 times more likely to commit crimes, 20 times more likely to drop out of schools. It's, I mean, all this, the... He gets exactly to the heart of the urban problem. And then, uh, and he says, as, as black men, we have a responsibility to step up. We cannot abandon our roles, blah, blah, blah. It is the speech you, we had always hoped he would get. And the media were a little queasy about it because it's not what they wanted to hear. Three weeks later, on a hot mic uh, in Fox Studio, Jesse Jackson, then the leading voice of the civil rights community, speaking to another black guy. And here's what he does. And this is his exact words. He goes, black, Barack Obama talking down to black people. I want to cut his nuts out, right? Wow. And, and then he says, then he uses the N word and says, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I can't use it. You can't use it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the last we heard from Barack Obama on the subject of fatherhood. Wow. And what's particularly disappointing is because say what you will about Barack Obama, he's a good father. I mean, he's very yeah, sincere, yeah, he's dedicated certainly father. Is. Yeah, he really is. They have they have a beautiful family. Um, so you mentioned then uh, the Kennedys have brought a lot of the Irish who were dispersing, you know, not necessarily in the Democratic mold then, but their vote was, you know, going to the Republican side and whatever, but it brought... It 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 ultimately got Kennedy into the White House, at least in in good part. Um, the Democratic Party of that time and today, polar opposites, radically changed. Mean, you can't I compare mean, them. No, yeah, I mean Kennedy especially. Hmm. You know, Kennedy was a uh, uh, a champion of Joe McCarthy. Hmm. Uh, Bobby Kennedy's oldest child is has Joe McCarthy as his godfather. He worked for Joe McCarthy. Yeah. Joe Kennedy was, and uh, you know, Joe McCarthy has gotten a bad rap by history too. So I'm not saying that to make Kennedys look bad, but to show that they were like uh, many Irish Catholics at the time, they were fundamentally conservative. Hmm. Uh, you wouldn't know it from the way they behaved necessarily, but they <laughs> they uh, uh, they were anti-communist. That was a big part of Catholic Irish culture. Yeah. And um, 
What happened afterwards uh, was that as the party drifted to the left, uh, the many, many Catholics followed along, many did not. And I, I go to a traditional Catholic church in Kansas City. And if you showed up with an Obama or Hillary Clinton bumper sticker, your car would be key. I mean, <laughs> it is 100% non-democratic. I mean, there may be some people voting for strange outlier parties, but it's, mm -hmm. there, is, there are no Democrats and no one would dare come to our, you know, it just wouldn't happen. Uh, so the Catholics, the practicing Catholics in America vote largely to the right. Uh, the nominal Catholics, like a Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden, do whatever they want to do. But, um, and so the Irish uh, in that population, you know, they were still affected by that skew, by the Kennedy skew. I think it still lingers. Yeah, and there's a, a fond um, memory of that. And, um, you know, that's still there. But um, I'm sure the abortion issue was the final straw as far as a lot of Irish Democrats were, were you know, if they were, you know, pro-life, let's say, and, um, you know, anti-abortion, and they didn't that shift a lot of them to the... Yeah, it did and has, and it's why uh, so many, uh, like serious Catholics now are are Catholic because, of the, are, are Republicans because of the abortion issue. Yeah. Teddy yeah. Kennedy had a chance to, to save millions of babies. I mean, literally just get cut right to the chase. He uh, came out at originally, like many Democratic politicians, on the pro-life side of that issue. Mm. But the feminist movement was sufficiently strong in, uh, in the 1970s, particularly, that, that they washed away their, you know, the residual restraint of certain people and, and took it with them, like Kennedy and, and a lot of other Democrats, lesser Democrats who went from being uh, nominally pro-life anyhow to being yeah. gung-ho yeah. uh, pro-abortion. Yeah, no, it's 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 an extreme abortion platform that the Democrats have. So I always thought that if some pro-life voices could stand out within the, you know, democratic machine and maybe in the labor movement, God help us, that probably wouldn't happen. And said, look, we're pro-life. We want to, you know, we want a, a pro-life um, line of thinking here, if you will, but. I mean, I wonder, would any of that ever fly? They wouldn't survive a primary. Mm. They, they, today, no, uh, no pro-life Democrat of any stature could survive a, a primary, and they would be primaried immediately. Just yeah. one other note on the Irish Catholic uh, thing, John. In 1969, uh, so what happened to many of us, I transferred my affection really to Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. And then he was killed in 68. And, and then so, um, so you right. remained a Democrat for quite a while. You were a, you were a voting party. Right, I know I hadn't, but I'm, I still wasn't old enough to vote. I was oh, I see. You were well. You were a kid it's on your paper. No, I was not. Uh, I yeah, was not old enough in '68. Yeah, but in, in 1969, uh, Teddy Kennedy, of course, goes off the bridge in Chappaquiddick. Right mm -hmm. now, for a lot of people, that may have seemed uh, relatively insignificant in terms of larger political development. But the Mary, by this time we moved to a Newark housing project. The Kopechnys lived in our project. Mary Jo Kopechny's family had really? lived there. Wow. I didn't know them and they had moved by this time, but many of my neighbors knew them and they were horrified. And oh. then they began to see it as uh, the Kennedys as a class, uh, you know, began to see the class differential between the Kennedys and the way they treated little people and the way they saw themselves. Mm. So there was a beginning of a movement away from the Kennedy, uh, uh, you know, the, especially after the two brothers were killed, Teddy did a great job in severing a lot of Irish Catholics from the, from the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah, no, it was a lot of affection. I mean, uh, a lot of affection for the Kennedys in Ireland. And, you know, I got to say, I have a soft spot for JFK myself. I think an unrealized dream cut short, but we, of course, we'll never know. You know, I, I have a soft spot too. Whenever I see clips of JFK, you know, I still think of them the way I did when I was a 12 year old or 13. Year old, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I, I want to look again at the book that you're doing research. And uh, when will this book be published on the dispossessed tales from America's great unsung ethnic diaspora? If I have the working title correct. It's pretty close. Uh, I keep changing it. <laughs> but, the, uh, 
Uh, I'm, it's the untold story of America's great ethnic diaspora. The mm. Dispossessed is the title. Mm. My deadline is September 1, which means the book will come out probably in January of, uh, of um, 2023. And what I think I'll do, I usually do a book TV. I've done 11 different book TVs on C-SPAN and uh, you know where they film your presentation. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure I'll come to New Jersey to do that one. So. Well, yeah, well, I hope we I hope we'll meet up at that point too. Yeah. Jack. Um, I want to talk, um, try to get in uh, about your career. You, I mean, you're a prolific writer, and I, you have your own website, jackcashel.com. You just don't... no, just cashel.com. Cashel.com. Oh, cashel.com. Thank you yes. for the correction. Yes. Um, your most recent one was Barack Obama's Promised Land, and then you had I don't know if was this a title unmasking Obama? Yes. Right. Okay, and then you've collaborated on numerous documentaries, um, including apparently um, Pope Emeritus um, Benedict. Yeah, I did. I, I had the, uh, uh, the wonderful opportunity to interview uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger. Mm -hmm. I just uh, and it was in nineteen ninety eight. Uh, we did a documentary for the uh, traditional movement of the Catholic Church. Now, when you uh, say the, a lot of people will get that, but some won't. That's the Latin Rite Catholics, yeah. correct? Right, right, right. That's correct. And you're a, you go when you you mentioned you, you go to a traditional church in Kansas. That's it, it's the Latin Rite Mass. That's correct. And and within the Latin Rite, by the way, this is the Latin. Uh, this is the order, the priestly fraternity of Saint Peter, that is uh, fully aligned with Rome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's another order that's you know on. Uh, yeah. So you're in communion and uh, all's good. Right. Now, uh, that doesn't mean... Because it wasn't all good, pro. Jack. You know, I might not. I might have to cut this interview <laughs> short. <laughs> but uh, no, it was a great story. I mean, I, I, I made documentaries as well. And this one, they, I contracted with us to go to Rome uh, to celebrate the uh, revival of the traditional movement under Pope John Paul II. Mm. Uh, and Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI, was a total champion of the traditional movement. Very so, interesting. And I got to do an interview with him one on one uh, at the time, and it was my most cosmopolitan moment ever since he uh, was was uncomfortable in English. So we did the interview in French, right? And this was in the Vatican. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was at, uh, around the Vatican, just outside okay. the Vatican. It was at a big conference, mm -hmm. and. Um, was, you know, my spoken French is much better than my comprehension, right? Mm -hmm. So I would ask him a question, it would sound halfway reasonable, like, uh, and then he'd say something back to me, and I'd, I'd say, oh, boo, boo, boo. <laughs> you know, and then I'd ask him another question, and <laughs> go back and translate it later on, you know? So, mm -hmm. Wow, then, that's, that's, that was incredible access. Yeah, and then as, and, and a, an amazing moment of, uh, of kismet or serendipity, yeah. I was in, Paris in 2005 for a, a conference on another subject that I've written about the flight of TWA flight 800. Uh, the plane, yeah, the TWA flight that's one of your, yeah. And I was there for uh, like a, a little conference and I had a day to kill, so I just you know meandered down to Notre Dame. I walk into Notre Dame, I could say a date, April 19, 2005. And usually in Notre Dame, you've probably been there, they just, yeah, have, I was, yeah, I was there a couple you know, of years people ago. circulating around the outside, you know, yeah. but. They had a section reserved for the faithful. It was filled with faithful. Yeah. And so what's going on here? And then I see these TV screens up above, and I'm thinking, it's kind of blasphemous. What are you doing with TV screens? Some French talking head, you know? Yeah. And then I'm not there 30 seconds, literally. And then they switch uh, to the balcony of the Vatican. And they said, we have a new pope, right? Oh, my goodness. And then they said, uh, uh, and they and say his name, you know, Colonel Joseph Ratzinger. Mm. And... I was really overcome and I was standing there and I said, Hey, I know that guy. <laughs> you know, <so laughs> there is an American couple next to me, right? We're just standing, you know, looking at TV, like around the church is filled with people. And they all, here's what they did to a person. They stood up and applauded, right? The faithful stood up and applauded. Mm -hmm. The uh, woman next to me says, this is a terrible day for women. You know, she says, right. And her right. husband said, shut up, honey, come on. <laughs> so I didn't, that, for, that spared me from having to do the same thing. So um, anyhow, uh, that happens. And then about 20 minutes later, I walk outside. And by this time, the media have to send it on the square in front of Notre Dame. 
and they're interviewing people and they asked me for an interview and I did a half-assed French interview, you know. Yeah. They said, bon choix, you know. Yeah. He respects the church tradition, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then they roll their eyes and walk away and I'm thinking, okay, my French isn't great, I get it. But I get back, I'm watching TV in uh, my hotel room that night and they said, and the, and the, the uh, media universally went into this mode. Today, they announced the uh, new Pope and, and at Notre Dame, the uh, response was total disappointment, right? I'm thinking, what? how did they avoid the thousand people who stood up and cheered, you know? Didn't they leave the church too? But what they were doing, just like they do here, mm. is they edit the news selectively to mm. uh, achieve the narrative they want to achieve. It doesn't matter what the reality was. And the media in uh, Europe, because I, I, I was spent the next week or two in France, and in fact, I stayed with a priest in uh, Bordeaux, was um, uh, outraged. It was like when Trump was elected in, in the United States as president. It was a comparable reaction, so. Yeah, well, yeah, that's media bias, and that's something, um, you've studied media, and you, in fact, have come in for some criticism um by people who think you're really big on these conspiracy theories and so on and maybe what you're doing is setting the record straight sometimes that's it i i only deal in facts john i i don't believe in conspiracy you know i mean i i don't believe in putting anomalies together and trying to pull a theory out of it you know it's mm. i start with the logic i mean if there's no logic to dictate a series of a sequence of events and the anomalies aren't going to add up but yeah. there are many, and unfortunately, they're becoming more and grander, uh, mistold or untold stories. Yeah. I mean, if you look just at the last, the entirety of the Trump administration, where he was dogged by this Russia collusion scandal, right? Yeah. Which was echoed by our intelligence community, by the White House, by uh, every major media except for Fox. Mm -hmm. And they did it for three years, and they still haven't apologized. Yeah, and up on your website, you have a fascinating piece that you wrote about a new movie that came out um, on the presidential election and right. dealing with this whole idea that was rigged. And you have an interesting thesis on that, if you could explain it, the timing right. of the movie and events that occurred just about the same time. Yeah, because I went to see the premiere night. It was in theaters on Monday, May 2nd. It's called 2000 Mules. Yeah. And it's about, you know, we, we've, I've always suspected that Democrats stole the election. By the way, they stole the 1960 election. Now that's pretty much given. Yeah. That's the one Kennedy won. I didn't want to know it at the time, but it's, mm -hmm. it's true. They, um, this is the question that I had for the people who were saying it was stolen was how? I need to see the mechanism. How? How was this done? What 2000 Mules does is it does a brilliant job of laying out how it was done. And, uh, and all it took was five cities, key cities and five key states. And, and that was, um, you know, people can see the movie. I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But so it was utterly riveting. My, I, my audience, my theater was full. The audience response was they were galvanized. It was just totally cathartic. I get home and I go on Twitter immediately to see what the Twitter response is. Well, there is no Twitter response because that day, that time, that evening, while the movie was being premiered all across America, they were leaking the uh, Alito draft uh, for the uh, Roe decision, right? Yeah. And that's all anyone wanted to talk about. And then, you know, I, I believe that was coordinated. I'm, I, you know, I'm just speculating here, but I think that was coordinated to a, uh, lessen the impact of 2,000 mules. But as it turned out, they didn't need to do that because Fox uh, and Newsmax are uh, afraid to go over there. They're afraid. Really? To this. Yeah, they're not allowed. I mean, they are literally the Fox uh, news host. I mean, Tucker Carlson, you know, Hannity, et cetera, are not allowed to talk about 2,000 mules. Is the fear uh, that it could unleash some kind of um, social unrest, exacerbate tensions, um, you know, so severely divide the country that we might not recover from it? I mean, it's pretty radical if it can be conclusively proved that it was rigged and stolen. Uh, that's part of it, I'm sure. And uh, but part of it on the, 
you know, and John, you've probably seen this enough to, to know that a lot of the conservative media in the United States are really pretty timid. Yeah. And they'll uh, cover a story after it's been out in the, the marketplace for a while, but they're not going to break a story. They're not going to introduce yeah. a story that might possibly be wrong. I mean, the major media have no problem with that. They had no problem with running with the, uh, yeah. the Russian collusion story. They won. Yeah. They gave themselves Pulitzer prizes for it. I mean, literally in 2018. Hand them back. <laughs> 2018, Washington Post and New York Times shared the Pulitzer for their, you know, breakthrough stories on the Russia collusion. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. You know? And 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 as you know, it's United States isn't half bad compared to Ireland, say, or yeah. most European countries. Yeah, exactly. Well, you've been around long enough. You know how the me media works, how it can be manipulated, and there are handlers out there. And I'm, sh I'm sure you've seen dirty tricks over the years where some scandal was about to break, and then the handlers figured, you know what? We leak something else to take the attention away. That's that happens often. Yes. Yeah. And that may have been the case with uh, uh, with the Alito document, except that. Um, that would make more sense if the Alito people had leaked it. Because for the yeah. Democrats, what it does is it, it minimizes the impact of the full announcement. Mm. So that by that time, it'll be, you know, when, when the left does it, it's so that when something comes out, which yeah. they do, what they've been doing with the Russia collusion story, little dribs and drabs. Yeah. So, oh, that's old news. That's not, yeah. that doesn't matter. But as a political strategy with the Alito document, uh, I, I don't get it. I, I'm just at a loss to understand that. Yeah, why it was, I mean, one thought was that it was a trial balloon, get it out there and then massage it later on and just see how the country reacts. But the media was all over it, and right. sending their cameras out to film these protests and so on. And then the country was short of baby formula. And, you know, where was the same kind of coverage? Yeah, no, and uh, they oddly go together. I mean, it. You know, if you're going to have babies. Babies, and yeah, wonder, exactly. It's you know? kind of ironic. Yeah. Uh, I want to get a little bit in about your Irish background, which we've discussed. You've spent time in Ireland, and yes. we have a lot of listeners over there. Were you doing research, or what was going on over there that took you to Ireland? Well, you know, I, I visited as a kid. I mean, when I was, uh, in, you know, hitch I hitchhiked through Ireland in 1970, actually, mm. just as a lark, you know. And, yeah. You know, my family is named Cashel and we have a rock there in our honor, you know, big, big a rock of Cashel. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's the spelling of uh, my family name is changed over all, you know, had his names changed and you yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, probably yeah. changed. And to change over a few Jemisons and yeah. all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, uh, the real breakthrough came is my wife is a professor of, you know, her Irish studies is her specialty. Okay. So uh, in our, my, you know, I've been back a couple of times as a visitor, but in 92, 93, we spent the whole year in, in Galway. And my kids were then eight and 13, two girls. So they went to school there. And it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. And it was a, a wonderful time in Ireland. And um, Galway was the most, it was the perfect city. Yeah. Uh, at that time. I, I, and I've been back since. It's not quite the same, partly because prosperity is... Mm put too many cars on the road for the amount of roads you have. And yeah, right. you got so, that right. And whereas in- And the I politics has changed as you know. As yeah, you, right, and the culture you and I have You and I have discussed various referenda and so on. Yeah, because when I was there, there was a, a referendum on, on whether Irish women could go to England for an abortion. Yeah. Uh, divorce was still illegal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not just that. I'm going to stop you there, Jack. It just it, this is an interesting statistic. Um, I won't comment on the yay or nay on that vote, but there was a very small vote for on the divorce referendum. It was a rainy day in Ireland. I mean, uh -huh. bad, solemn kind of day. That's maybe that's kind of not unusual. <laughs> yeah, there was, was only uh, very few people actually. Yeah, right. Um, very few people went out to vote. The vote was only 21 percent of the voting electorate. 21 percent something like that so there was no there was no even demand interestingly enough for for divorce in ireland and it just got in by a way for thin margin yeah I, probably because most people were conflicted about the the debate you know whether which side to vote I, i'm just guessing but yeah i don't the know. undecideds were probably very high for that 
Yeah, yeah. Because um, there's an argument could be made either way. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's a long debate and it's a long discussion and there's different, you know, there's the, uh, I mean, for Catholics who take their faith seriously, then there's the annulment process and, you know, to death us do part and then there's the civil thing. But then we moved on to other referenda on, a, on an extreme abortion, if you will, or not, right. well, that, that's not a way of characterizing it, but legalizing abortion, right? Yeah. And you know, that, that they had to push that so hard. Nobody wanted it. They kept pushing. And then the Irish government set up some kind of um, uh, a civic, um, the name will come to me, but um, they outsourced it, if you will, to uh, a civilian sort of entity to kind of do all the dirty work. And then it was downhill from there. You know, because I went back in the year 2000, I went back 2005, 2012. And each time uh, I, I went, John, you could see that unlike the United States, what Ireland lacked and probably still and still does as far as I could tell, is a uh, a conservative media infrastructure mm. of any consequence. There's no Rush Limbaugh, you know. Yeah. There's no Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. There's no, uh, and it was that was desperately needed 30 years ago in Ireland. There's, yeah, because I'd be watching the media and, you know, there were limited choices to, as to what you watch and hear. And there was, uh, there would be no alternative voices allowed to, to present. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and even on issues like the travelers, for instance, you know. Irish travelers, yeah. Right. They're and, an, uh, no, well, I won't say ethnic group, but they're kind of a separate group in Ireland, if you will. Lovely well, people. Before Ireland had an ethnic group, they had the Tinkers, you know, you call them yeah, Tinkers yeah, and yeah. Travers. Mm. And in my experience with them were kind of scary. I, mean, I had a couple of <laughs> run-ins. Uh, and I, it would seem to me that you were, it was, that one should be able to discuss them in some rational way, you know, their history, their what they do, how they behave, you yeah. know, but you weren't, you know, and, and that sort of set the precedent for, how you how Ireland would then deal with various ethnic groups that came in or gay people or whatever. Yeah. You weren't allowed to discuss it, essentially. I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but you know better than I. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we saw that during the um, abortion referendum a few years ago. Um, the media was extraordinarily biased yes. um, and there was a lot of misinformation. And right up to uh, the final vote, uh, it looked as if the eighth amendment would stay in place and that was the pro-life eighth amendment as i like to characterize it but as we saw it was repealed under extraordinary pressure from our political leaders who should have known better and had once promised to retain it but did a flip no moral courage right and the youth vote was overwhelming and it's discouraging yeah. Yeah, it really is. But, um, you know, there's there's hope there. And uh, the other kind of extraordinary thing is that when you have pro-life marches in Ireland and you had coming up to the Eighth Amendment, like thousands and thousands of Irish people took to the streets, hundreds of thousands. And when there's a pro-choice rally, I mean, no exaggerate, no exaggeration on this, you might get hundreds. Right. You get the same numbers. It's always this radical fringe changes these things. Amazing. Yeah, you know, because in 2009, uh, I made a documentary about the uh, March for Life in Washington each year, which takes place on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. It's in mid-January. Yeah. I was actually right after the inauguration that year of Obama. So the, the platforms are still up. And, you know, 350,000 people show up, right? Yeah, yeah. Doesn't make the news. Right? No, never makes the news. Doesn't make the news. And That's then what everybody show, says. I had there'd be a half a dozen, you know, counter protesters with their little signs, and that would make the news. Or they would show one picture of some people and as though it was like a, some balanced coverage. It's crazy. Yeah. So no, because I've had this debate and discussion with people, and everybody has busy lives uh, in New York and elsewhere. So. But when you start to study the reality of things, you start to see, puts things in perspective. And this is not yay or nay for Donald Trump at all, but he has tapped into that. Yes. He, he in a sense, knows the American soul, in my mind, better than a lot of established politicians. Well, you're right, because he was the first 
uh, Republican president ever to show up at a at the March for Life, right? Yeah. yeah. That means that Reagan didn't show up. Uh, neither of the Bushes showed up. No. Uh, but Trump, and let's face it, he was not a moral paragon coming in. No, absolutely life. not. Let's not get carried away here. No. And, and he never made any bones he about being in New York, but he's maybe he's reformed and he delivers on his promises. I think he was influenced by his own supporters. Hmm. And so I think he, he went from being just like a, someone manipulating or willing to exploit the sentiment to someone who began to believe. Because if you're exposed yeah. to the pro-life side, you see that they have all the good arguments, both moral and in the United States constitutional. Uh, it's hard to, to, I was, you know, coming at it as a Democrat young. And then when uh, Roe v. Wade is passed and when I'm 20, right? It's like my get out of jail free card, <laughs> you know, sexual revolution, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I was on that. I was on that side. And then I, until the scales started falling from my eyes, I began to see things. I had my own baby, uh, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and then the constitutional law became clear to me. And, and then I, I found that I have no argument on behalf of the pro-choice side. It's, there is no argument. There's no moral yeah. argument. And in the United States, there's no constitutional argument. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, the good thing about the last month or so is that that debate has started in the United States. People beginning to understand what Roe v. Wade did, the rights it took away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're making incremental changes here. Most people are going to be stuck in their mindset forever, but you just need to change 10% of the middle and you can make a difference. Absolutely. And of course, there's been so much tragedy and heartbreak and trauma as a result. Right. So there's all that history too is, is coming, coming to the fore. Uh, Jack, uh, we're getting close to running out of time. I just, uh, do you want to, what, of all the books you've written and novels, what's the top two, three that you're most proud of? That I've written? Uh, I would say, um, I would say my most recent book on TWA Flight 800, which is called, uh, TWA Flight 100, The Crash to Cover Up the Conspiracy. And I would go back to uh, Deconstructing Obama, a book I wrote in uh, uh, 2011. Because mm -hmm. I was the one who broke the, I broke the story that uh, terrorist Bill Ayers was a, had a major hand in the writing of Barack Obama's book, Dreams from My Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2008, when that came out, it could have flipped the election. So for a month, I lived with the possibility that I was the guy <laughs> who could reverse the course of history. Oh, gee, that's a nice one. Oh, wow. No, it's really tense. You know, phone rings. I don't know. But what happened is that's when I learned how just how utterly timid and cowardly are the conservative media are. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't expect any help from the liberal media, but my thesis was so solid. Yeah. All I needed was people just to sit down and look at my evidence, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, looked, I needed someone like the National Review or the Weekly Standard or Fox News to say, Hey, this guy's got a point. I mean, Let's get him on. Let's get him on right. Hannity or something. Right. I mean, Rush Limbaugh talked about it, bless his heart. But uh, once he talked about it, that was it. It died. I had a month. I went to Washington. I met with people and I just saw the way the apparatus worked. They were already packing up their bags, looking for new jobs. Gosh. Uh, they had stayed resigned, you know, so yeah. the story died. And what in, so in, in the book, uh, Deconstructing Obama, I talk not only about his real life, but I talk about the the dynamic of what happens when you get a hold of a major story. So yeah, very good. And uh, if listeners and viewers, because this will go up on YouTube, want to learn more about you, buy your books, find out what you're up to, can you give us any of the addresses? The yeah, handles just there? Cashel dot com, C A S H I L L dot com. I beat all my relatives to that website twenty five years ago. They're still mad at me. So <laughs> gotta, that's okay. Gotta, well, you know, Irish have no Irish hold grudges, but we love each other. Um, <laughs> and and you want to hear from um, people from the neighborhood that New York. Yes, ideally, the closer to my neighborhood, the better. But anyone uh, in the United States who has a story of comparable story, uh, that they've left our neighborhood and they can have right, all these right. memories. Also, by the way, you're, uh, I'm going to be in Ireland in uh, late July. Yes, with fifty of my closest relatives, we're going to Kinsale. Right. Mm -hmm. And so anyone who's in a neighborhood, stop by. <laughs> um, I'm, we're planning some kind of a trip. I better be careful because my relatives will be listening and they'll be all waiting to welcome <laughs> us. But I'm planning some kind of a trip to Ireland this year. But if I'm there in July, I'll try to catch up with you, Jack. Been an incredible 
pleasure. Um, been a, informative, learned a lot. And um, yeah, I recommend people get your books and come to your assistance on the research. Not that you need a ton of assistance because you've got so much done already for this right. book that's coming out later in the year. We're excitedly waiting for it, Jack. Very good. And John, I wanted to thank you for your help in putting my proposal together on the Ireland book, which is still in the burner. Oh, I just yeah. got to... I got to move this one first and then we'll see what happens. Yeah. What time. should we disclose that on the air, that, that, that book we're talking about just yeah, we, you know, In fact, it's the title, I, I was undecided on the title of either Saving Ireland, hmm. uh, you know, from the ruins of the woke revolution yeah. or Ireland rising, I, you know, depending on uh, when, I, when I did my research, mm -hmm. whether I saw enough of a movement to say that there is a, a, a grassroots movement in Ireland willing to fight back against the whole the yeah. uh, woke ideology that sees the Western world. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, the Irish saves, how would the Irish save civilization? You know, this no, is another. Yeah, right, exactly. They this is the latest. Second chance. Yeah, right. yeah, second chance. <laughs> but we'll, re, we, we'll come together on that at a later point. And right. Jack Cash has been just so terrific having you on my show. Well, thank you much. Actually, yeah, the ideal title would be How the Irish Save Civilization Again. <laughs> 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 That's the ideal. So. Hey, John, thanks a lot. Thanks for your help, and uh, we'll be in touch, okay?